Okay, we can start now. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so great. Hello, everyone. Uh, you can hear me all right, right? Okay, great, yeah. Thanks so much for coming to our queer panel. I tell you, we are way cooler than anybody else here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Ankur Paliwal. I'm an independent journalist and founder of Queer Beat Media, which is a collaborative journalism project that accurately, I want to stress on this word, accurately and deeply covers queer stories in India. Um, the other day we were all talking that there are so many things that we want to talk about and we have just 50 minutes, too short, but we'll try to do our best uh, and still have 10 minutes for questions and answers. So I'm going to drive straight into our panel discussion. Did I say straight? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, anyway, yeah. <laughs> so um, historically speaking, most of the mainstream media in the Global South has been under-reporting and often misreporting the identities, issues, and stories of LGBTQIA plus persons. In fact, in many countries, including India and parts of Africa, it is complicit in perpetuating homophobia and transphobia in society. All of this then shapes the public conversation and what the society thinks about us. Um, at Queerbeat uh, in India, we recently did an online poll asking people what did they think about how the media covers queer lives and their issues. Over 60% people said that media often misrepresents misrepre queer people and their stories, and over 80% said that the current reporting doesn't reflect the diversity of the issues and concerns of queer people in India because of which the conversation is stuck, it's not advancing. So how do we correct these narratives and advance the narratives? What's the role of media in that? Who in the media should be telling these stories? And what are the challenges when queer people tell these stories? So we are going to talk, talk about all of these things today and more. Now I'll introduce my lovely queer panel here. Uh, Next to me, Nana Darkua Sekhema, that's all right, yeah. <laughs> uh, the author of The Sex Lives of African Women, which Publishers Weekly described as an astonishing report on the quest of sexual liberation. She's also the co-founder of Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women, a website, podcast, and festival that publishes and creates content that tells stories of African women's experiences around sex, sexualities, and pleasure. Thanks, Rana. Uh, Rafiul Alam Rahman is the founder and director of the Queer Muslim Project, Asia's leading online platform for queer and Muslim voices. The project is focused on culture building. It uses digital storytelling, creative campaigns, and artistic production to re-narrate public conceptions of queerness in South Asia in a way that visibilizes the diversity of queer lived experiences and transcends intentional misrepresentation, and socially reinforced stereotypes. Caleb Okereke, wonderful outfit here, <laughs> uh, is the co-founder and managing editor at Minority Africa, a digital publication telling minority stories across Africa. So I'll start here. I'll turn to you, Nana, first. Uh, and I want sort of you to talk about the uh, queer phobia and the misrepresentation in the media. The other day when we were talking, you were saying that how the media in Ghana, where, where you live, is not only queer phobic, but actively instigate violence against queer people. Do you want to elaborate more on that? Sure. And um, I almost want to apologize for this image you have on the screen, because it's really a traumatic experience, but it's also the reality of our lives in Ghana, where homophobia is really fostered by the media. Um, a lot of you will know that Ghana is also a country where there's currently an anti-LGBTI bill that's been proposed before the parliament, and media are contributing heavily to fostering a climate of hate um, against queer people. This is really recent. This is from the 19th of April. You don't have to look far to find homophobia in the media in Ghana. It's not by fringe journalists or, you know, people with little blogs. It's in mainstream media. 
um, and it's everywhere. And this is um, a recent, this is based on a recent radio interview that someone who's aspiring to be a member of parliament for a major um, political party, one of the two leading political parties in the country said, you know, and these are the kind of stories that get published. Um, it's whenever queer people are bold enough to go on radio stations, to go on television stations, the, I mean, I wonder why people actually still do it, because I have personally made the choice not to, because they get baited a lot, um, they get misreported, they usually find themselves on platforms with well-known homophobes who really insist on talking about whatever they imagine queer people do in their bedrooms, right? So limiting the conversation to sex as opposed to the politics or human rights or anything that queer people can speak about. Um, we actually have an association of journalists against LGBTI, you know, um, even though the journalistic code of ethics actually say that journalists should obviously not foster hate. And nobody criticizes this. The Institute for Journalism has never criticized any of the journalists who basically foment homophobia. Um, these are journalists who, who thrive and make a living yeah. and you know, basically offer up the lives of queer people as clickbaits to drive traffic. Um, and yeah, this is really like one mm -hmm. of the big issues um, we have in the country. For folks who want to read more about this, Dr. Wunpini Mohammed has really written a re really good article analyzing um, the content of homophobia in articles in Ghana. It's very rare to have what anyone would describe as a balanced story. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, of course, when it comes to the lives of people, there's nothing like a balanced, like there shouldn't be a balanced story, right? People deserve to be presented in all of their dignity and to be able to speak for themselves. Um, I don't think I know anybody who publicly identifies as a queer journalist in Ghana. It wouldn't be safe to do so. Um, I'm obviously a, diff a bit different, but mm -hmm. I also don't, I consider myself to be a writer and an activist, right, not right. a journalist. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I have also made the decision, for example, in the past few years, not to go on Ghanaian media platforms, because I even see the people who recently, with the, with the bill that's in front of parliament, what for me has been really encouraging is a lot of, I guess the people are described as the old school feminist activists, the academics, the human rights lawyers, have really, you know, gone into media houses to speak up for queer rights. Right. And even they get attacked, you know, even they are told, oh, this professor, they've studied so much has gone to their heads, you know, and then the people that are brought on to speak in opposition to them, you're like, you shouldn't be on a right. platform with this right. person. Right, right, right. Um, but this is really the situation when it comes to journalism and the the fermentation of, I don't know if that's the word, <laughs> right. of homophobia. Fermentation is right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, amongst yeah, journalists, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Caleb, I want to bring in here, um, uh, you know, we were talking the other day about how uh, this queer phobia uh, really exists in even uh, Eastern Africa, uh, where you come from, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually, hi everybody, thank you for coming. But um, I, I actually think that what, what I see a lot of um, happen is similar to what Nana is saying in terms of how there's this idea of what is balance and what is objectivity, right? And so we, we often find that people are being sort of pitted against each other so you so to, to quote unquote be objective, right? And so how many of us know this, this meme, like on the screen, the why are you gay meme? Have we seen it on Twitter? Yeah, good. Great, but the, it's a uh, meme people always use on Twitter to like say, oh, why are you gay? But the actual history of it is, is, is very interesting. And it was from a December 2012 interview on TV that had a trans man and a popular anti-gay pastor in Uganda, but it was on the morning show, so like highly platformed. And I think what was really interesting for me is that this journalist in the image who became like the symbol of this meme, the one in the black jacket, um, not only did they have this interview, but it became a part of their identity. So like a few months ago, I was like on Twitter and I was like lo looking at their bio and it's like, oh, the creator or something of the why are you gay meme. And I was like, how does homophobia, not just that you do it, but then it becomes your brand, right? That's a crazy thing. Um, and I think that's simply because for the climate that we have in places like Uganda and Kenya and really much across Africa, homophobia is not only um, 
you know, it's not only incentivized by the media, it's also rewarded. And so people are, are rewarded for actually sort of like acting in this way, right? And that's the only reason why somebody who works for one of the biggest news stations in Uganda will think that it's okay for my brand to be homophobia. And I think that's, that, that's really concerning. And for me, and for like minority Africa, which is why I always say there's not, you know, both sides to a story all the time. There's sometimes just one side of a story. And if we want to both side everything, we, we often find ourselves as media and as journalists who constantly find ourselves in a binary and in a box in which we're being pitted against a side that shouldn't even be platform in the first place. Right, right. Thanks for um, uh, adding that, Caleb. I actually saw this clip. So, I mean, when the the journalist is asking why are you gay and the person is not responding then then the person says are you lesbian i mean it's just it's just bizarre yeah and a lot of this happens because of um, our underrepresentation in the media space uh, because uh, cis heterosexual people are in the leadership positions we are not so they are controlling the narratives they are deciding what stories gets told whose voices are uplifted. So I want to bring you in, Rafuel, here um, to, uh, to talk about uh, this underrepresentation of LGBTQIA people in the, in the media, not just in the journalism space, but broadly uh, in mass media. And uh, what really are the consequences of that on the community? Thank you, Ankur. Uh, no, I think uh, both Nana and Caleb have uh, really uh, laid out the, the problem with what exists currently. And we've seen that sometimes the reporting is violent because even if uh, it's coming, sometimes, uh, and, and to give an example of the film industry in indifference, and now we see that within Bollywood, a lot of new films are being made that talk about queer issues. And oftentimes, the argument is that it's coming from a place of good intention and there are going to be some stereotypes we have to bear with it, right? And I think this is also, I've seen uh, in the context of the English media in India, the mainstream media, where increasingly there's more queer reporting, but I think uh, there's an expectation that because the bare minimum is being done, you don't question and you mm -hmm. don't ask the tough questions. And I think, and um, I was just thinking that, you know, me being on this panel, like queer and Muslim, two explosive identities, <laughs> I think, um, you know, and, and um, just my experience of being a queer Muslim person in the context of current India, you know, with, with so much of uh, uh, violence that is targeted oftentimes at religious minorities. And then to talk about queerness within two communities, you know, and like to talk about issues in a nuanced and what uh, Ankur was saying accurate way is so difficult because... Who brings that accuracy? Who brings that authenticity? And what needs to happen for authentic stories to come to the fore? And I think at the Queer Muslim Project, when I started the Queer Muslim Project, uh, there was hardly an initiative that you know talked about queerness and Muslimness in 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 its nuances. You know that the, the, that being Muslim is not just you're not just a terrorist that that the media represents, right? Like that there is just so much nuance to the identity, the way people identify with faith, the way people come with uh, stories of family, love, acceptance, belonging, but also sometimes violence and exclusion, right? This is also layered and nuanced. And I think what I felt was that there was not a space where this could be shared, right? And oftentimes, the agency and the authorship was not in the hands of queer people and queer people coming from diverse intersections being able to tell those stories. So I think just um, at the Queer Muslim Project, what we've started doing is we realized that Narrative change and culture change is just, just so important. And, and when I say, of course, narrative change, I'm thinking of it broadly. Like, and, and at our end, we're doing the work that is at the intersection of art, culture, and media. So, and I think one of our focus has been is that how do you train and you, capacity, you know, build the capacity of queer storytellers, of activists, advocates, you know, to claim ownership and agency over their stories, to tell stories that are different uh, in writing, on the screen, in films. And, and shift what exists out there. You've said, what are the consequences of it? The consequences is that this work is not easy. Burnout is a real consequence. Um, and you know, and like, because we are also primarily a digital initiative, like we have a big presence on Instagram, we use a lot of social media. I think the, the abuse, the online harassment, the trolling that uh, one gets to see, and in the context of the government, where, where there are not, there is one not enough support system in general, not enough funding or resources, right? But on the other hand, there's also oftentimes a targeted violence and silencing. So within such a climate, how do you tell the stories that need to be told is I think 
what we are trying to currently figure out and work with. And I think and that's where I feel like it's just so affirming to see so many people in this room and to understand that some of this work will have to be done collectively as in partnership with each other. Mm -hmm. And no one organization, I think, can do justice because our experiences as queer people are also so diverse and this panel is not enough, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So thanks again for coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I completely agree with what uh, uh, Rafiul say, and and we have been uh, talking about it a lot uh, uh, since we we came here, and I want to add to that uh, uh, conversation. Like in India, not a single week goes by when I and other queer journalists are not discussing the queer phobic headlines in the mainstream media, and uh, uh, the inaccurate narratives about our lives. Uh, and so much of it is coming from the cis heteronormative gaze uh, in the mainstream media, which continues to stereo stereotype. I mean, one of the stereotypes that uh, we often see is um, we are represented as overtly sexual beings. Nobody else is having sex here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, over representation of stories of violence against queer people. Uh, the angle of pity, which is totally coming from the cis heteronormative case. Yeah. The acceptance, the, the arc of the story is that toward the end, it's the acceptance by the cis heteronormative society. That something like that, as, as if this is all what we are seeking. Stories of queer joy are missing. If there are stories of queer joy being told, it's being told by us. Our identities are used as, as clickbaits. Just last month, uh, I came across a headline in one of the Indian newspapers where um, the headline said something like, homosexuality behind a businessman's murder. Later on in the story, uh, the journalist talks about the, uh, the murder was because of some financial uh, re reasons. There was a financial tussle. Um, and the man happened to be gay. But that was on the headline, you know, homosexuality behind, because that's how, that's what people will click. So I, identities are used as clickbaits. And the uh, stories was not accurately done. Uh, so every other day we are sending emails to each other, uh, writing how do we correct these narratives. And like Rafiul was saying, it really is uh, leading to uh, burnout. How much of it will we do? And that's why we need more uh, collaborative uh, space. And it really has... Uh, uh, when we talk of implications and consequences, it really has harmful uh, implications on the community. When you say that homosexuality is behind the business's murder, you're telling something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so at Queerbeat, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we correct uh, the narratives. Uh, when on one hand we talk about uh, increasing our visibility in the media space, the visibility is really a double-edged sword. It's really a personal choice that many of us uh, have to make based on the cultural and political climate of the country we live in and our multiple identities. Uh, we are not just queer, we are Muslim and different uh, castes uh, uh, and communities uh, in different regions. So it's really about our uh, safety and we have to uh, navigate that. And I want to bring you, Nana, here is that how do you navigate your identity uh, uh, in Ghana as a queer person? What choices you are making uh, there? Mm. No, it's a great question. Um, because in many respects, I'm a highly visible person. And on the other hand, I feel protected by a lot of privilege that I have. I'm a middle class person who, you know, is a writer, a communication strategist, who works for herself, who works from home. Um, and also is not visibly read as queer, unfortunately for me. <laughs> um, and I mean, there are little things I haven't chosen to do just because for me, like I don't have a rainbow flag in my Twitter bio. Yeah. I think it makes a difference, you yeah. know? Um, and I've chosen not to go to like media platforms and speak about my book, for instance, even though of course when you're promoting your book, you want to be everywhere because I know that people find the book, especially queer people find the book. I think the feedback that has meant the most to me is people saying, I've never felt so seen in my life when they've read my book. 
you know, so I haven't felt like I've needed a Ghanaian media platform. And also, mm -hmm. I don't want to be platformed with homophobes. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. and I think I've just felt safe by being in my community, by being with feminist people, by being with queer people. But that's a lot of privilege that I personally have that a lot of people don't have, right? right. People get attacked in public transport and all sorts of things. And not everybody has control over how they are read, you know? Um, so I think I just basically benefit from like my socioeconomic privilege. Um, right. And part of how I feel safe is really being part of the feminist community. Um, but if anything changes in the next few years, please do a free Nana Dakwa hashtag. <laughs> if this bill gets passed in Ghana, you know, I don't know yeah. what yeah. even those of us who feel safe currently will do, literally. Right. You know, because the bill criminalizes even identifying as queer or doing anything that indicates advocating for the human rights of people. So being the author of a book like this would be criminal. Speaking on a platform like this would be criminalized. Right. And so the future is really uncertain right now. Right, right. Caleb, I also wanted to talk to you about this. While Lana spoke about uh, the safety issues related to us as journalists and editors, uh, how do you navigate the safety issues related to the sources that you're talking to for your studies? Thanks, Anko. I think that's a really great question because, you know, when, when you're, I think that representation is such a powerful thing. And so when I think about how I've seen queer people represented in like mainstream media all, all of my life, it's always been like, you know, people are showing, like they're showing the back of your head or like your fingers, you know, just like anything to keep them protected, which sometimes I think, you know, as a platform, we, we sometimes have to make the difficult choice about what is visibility, what is source protection, what is, you know, what, how, how, how do we sometimes, if you insist on, you know, protecting your source, how can that sort of, diminish their visibility in a way that is problematic. Like if you say that, oh, I, I don't want you to go on camera because I know better and I'm the journalist, um, how does that further push them to the fringes, right? And so the choices that we make around that, for instance, we did a story on the LGBT church in Uganda and we covered it and they were like, everybody was like, oh, look, I want to be on video, I want to be seen, I want to be on video. And so as a journalist, sometimes you're like, oh, but I know better, you shouldn't be on video because you're in Uganda, the president will find you. But we sat down and we were like, we actually, don't know better, you know, right? And I think that's a conversation that the mainstream media needs to have more. Sort of like this, there's, there's like this belief that as journalists we're, we're the only experts, but I think if we look at our sources as community, like Dina was saying today on Dina's great panel, but if you look at your sources and, and like your audiences and the people you sort of write about as your community, so sort of like the framework changes, right? And so now when we think about stories for like, like the church I talked about, we communicated the impact to them. We told them this could go incredibly viral, which it did. We told them this could be anywhere, which it did. And they were like, yes, I still want to be on video. And they were on video. But of course, there's two choices that we make. So for instance, we tried to film very close shots. So you can't like sort of see where the church is. You can see the general area, but you can't say, oh, it's this building or it's that building. But I think if you talk about visibility and, and safety, there has to be a very, there's a very thin line between you know, protecting your source and further pushing them to the margins as you try to assume what is best for their safety. And I think right. it's good to keep that in mind. Yeah, 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 that's really important. And I want to add that here at Queerbeat, we recently did a story on uh, uh, access to mental health, the challenges that queer women face while accessing uh, uh, mental health. And uh, because uh, a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists are just homophobic, they're just turning to their own community uh, for comfort. And in a sm uh, like all, every small town has like small hangout places, cafes, where uh, people uh, gather and talk about their issues, uh, go for comfort. And so while we are writing that story, Story. We had long conversation with the trans owner of that uh, um, hangout. Uh, should we print the name of the hangout or not? So it was a long conversation uh, with her, and eventually, and 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 that cafe is in a state which is uh, very homophobic, where the leader is homophobic. Uh, but she eventually uh, decided to print the name at the risk, she, she's aware of the risk. So you really need to have these conversations, but, but the final authority really rests with the person whose story is being uh, um, uh, written about. So while the mainstream media is doing so much harm and is not uh, uh, correcting the narratives, what is the role of social media then? Uh, and I want to shift the conversation uh, to social media now. And Rafiul, given um, all the problems that we have with the traditional media now, uh, and you exist primarily uh, on the social media space, 
TQMP, the Queer Muslim Project, is doing phenomenal work, phenomenal work uh, in building culture. Um, so, but I'm guessing there are also some limitations of being on social media, so can you just talk a little bit about that? Um, so I think one thing and a very important thing is that social media gives you legitimacy, especially if you come from a minority and a marginalized background, right? I mean, a few years back, we couldn't imagine like having a space within the mainstream media where you could talk about identities that are further at the intersections, right? And I think one question that since the founding of the Queer Muslim Project in 2017 that I have often been asked is why the Queer Muslim Project and not just the Queer Project? Like people who tell me, why are you making your life difficult? Nobody will give you the money. You know, I mean, uh, just say it's the LGBTQ project. I was like, and that's where you miss the plot because yeah. there is a reason it is queer Muslim project because often you have hardline Muslims telling us you don't belong. Oh no, you're not Muslim. Why are you even trying to claim a space within this faith? And then you have like, you know, Islamophobes who constantly tell you that, oh, you're trying to whitewash the violence in Islam by pro projecting positive stories, which is not the truth. I'm like, and who gets to tell the truth, right? And I think for TQMP, the, I think Instagram, and I must, uh, for all the problems with the company, <laughs> I mean, I have to say that as a platform, Instagram has been quite a powerful um, space for us. And to the point that today we have been able to work with partners that are, you know, legacy institutions, right? And they see a certain kind of validity in, like, in, in our work because of the numbers, which is really sad because, you know, you, they see that, okay, this person or this uh, initiative has so much of a reach. And I think within those kind of then parameters, we've had to think, how do we tell the story of our communities? Keeping their safety in mind, visibility is a double-edged sword, right? Issues of faith, even within queer community, a lot of queer people are not comfortable talking about faith because of, you know, the history of organized religion and the kind of violence it perpetuates against queer women, trans people. So I think then for us to figure out a way, I think Instagram really gave us the platform, number one, in sharing those stories, and stories oftentimes in their nuance of different kinds of experiences of queerness, of faith, of belonging to the uh, you know, kind of peripheries where you are not often visible, number one. Number two is I think the social media, and because we have a digital presence, we've been able to do work at a regional level. So a lot of our community members, like across India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and our gr work has grown from online to offline, as opposed to being the other way. Mm -hmm. Like I never had to have a physical office space and you know, like a physical working to then go out there and build an organization. We were very digital and that's why when COVID happened, for all the sadness associated with COVID, TQMP actually saw a sharp rise because a lot of people recognize the importance of the work we were doing. And the third thing is that because, you know, these stories were not there in the mainstream media, these voices are not there in the mainstream media. I think a lot of people now within the mainstream media are seeing value of what we are doing. And they're like, we have not done this, so you guys are doing it. How do you advise us better, you know? Or even platforms like Netflix and OTT platforms that reach out saying that, hey, we're coming up with this content. Can you provide, that, provide advisory services? I think there's also that kind of need that is coming up. And I think, um, and that is where I wanted to say that, you know, I think oftentimes there is this kind of silo that we create, traditional media and social media, or something is more valid. That's not the case. And even the kinds of stories and the storytelling formats that are used, I think, are so different. I wanted to just quickly, uh, yeah. just being mindful of time, I wanted to quickly show you all a reel that we did with a young Pakistani trans creator on our page. And I think Uncle I'll can just play, play that, yeah. yes. Yeah. <coughs> a lot of talking, so better to watch. Uh, there is no sound wait. Uh, Wait, 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 wait. Exploring social change. Sing Murit March since first again, indigenous trans pride. Yes, I'll play it again. Don't worry. <laughs>
welcome to a day in the life of a young trans adult living in Lahore, the city of Forest. Okay. Sorry about this. <laughs> no. Okay, but I need to go back to it again. Okay. Okay. Angkor, while this is set up, I think we can continue the conversation and then play this for the new friends. Sure. We can play this later too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. These tech glitches, oh my god, I hate them. <laughs> we are warming up to technology. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. It's a short video, so. Yeah. Yeah, but how do I go back to the presentation then? Hello, welcome to a day in the life of a young trans adult living in Lahore, the city of Fours. My name is Hussain, but I also go by Hussain, and I just finished college and I'm spending my first year out writing and making art exploring social change. Sin Murat March, since first indigenous trans pride parade is happening this week. So, I'm going to Liberty, a popular marketplace in Lahore to get some accessories for my parade fit. Much like the rest of South Asia, indigenous communities of trans people are fighting for autonomy over their identities. Today, in Pakistan, so many more trans people are recognizing their right to respectability and free expression, and Sin Murat March is a testimony to that. I see a lot of potential for positive change in Pakistan. Expressing my transness through my clothes and art has been my way of creating visibility for my community. I'm so hopeful that our culture is going to evolve to a point where we feel heard and supported, and it might take a while to experience the freedom we dream about, but I promise it's going to happen, because we're working on it. Bye! So, uh, the, the interesting thing is that this person, this young person that you saw in the video, they are also a young hip-hop artist. Mm -hmm. And we worked with them very closely recently. In December, we had a narrative change convening that we organized in Nepal. We had 10 artists and creators from across South Asia, and she was there, and she is an amazing rap artist. So I think, like, young queer people have so much to offer to this world. I mean, who is watching? I mean, that's all I would like to close this part with, yeah. Yeah, yeah I loved it. <laughs> um, uh, so like all the work that we want to do, that Rafiul have, have, uh, has been doing, what Caleb has been doing, and what I'm trying to do at, uh, 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 at Queer Beat, I mean, there is no doubt how critical LGBTQIA plus journalism is uh, today to really transform the public conversation about uh, uh, the LGBTQ persons, their rights, uh, and how do we safely uh, uh, tell our stories. So I want to sort of now shift the con conversation to solutions uh, uh, a bit. How do we do that? And how do we work around the challenges uh, we have? Um, going back to you, Rafiul, again, do you want to talk about um, some solutions or the challenges to get around the problems? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm just going to go back to Dina's panel from this morning and repeat what she was saying, because I think everybody resonates with the need for money and for more innovative ways of getting money. Now, one thing is that TQMP, when I started it, I was like all idealistic and I was like, you know, I need to register a not-profit organization. This is like, we are, an act we are activists. And then I realized there was no money and I was burning out. I was like, why is this not working? Because the government was ensuring that there is new law and compliance that will not let you receive the kind of support that funders are willing to provide. And so we had to register a private limited company. And what the challenge that we are now facing is that I think within a lot of uh, development sector kind of funding spaces, because we work at the intersection of social impact and media. Uh, so, um, and so we don't have a product product that you can sell and get money, right? So we need to depend a lot on grants. And I think the challenge is that um, the focus, uh, some, I mean, of course, feminist funders are amazing. We've had the opportunity to work with some feminist funders. They've given us flexible core support. But in general, it's quite frustrating because a lot of people don't understand why we exist as a private limited company. Because it's, it's a workaround, right? Especially in a time when you can't run your organization. And I think in India right now with a the, with the private limited company, it's easier, I would say. Of course, you pay taxes, but it's relatively easier than running an, an NGO uh, setup. And I think what is happening is that uh, there is a need for 
uh, funders and you know like and people in this ecosystem to think of what are the innovative and creative ways of taking money to organizations that are doing the work and i think uh, that's one thing i would like to just add to this conversation that a lot of this work is possible but if there is not enough support and resources i think it it's not going to sustain and yeah, yeah. so find money for us please <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, uh caleb i want to bring you here uh do you want to talk about how sort of we advance this work and uh, some of the sol solutions that you have been thinking about? Of course, I, I think that, you know, for, for me, and I think we've, we've talked about this like a little, but just the realization that like hate is not accidental, right? And so hate is not, you know, it's not organic, you know, hate is actually created. There's, and I, I, I just wrote a piece which you should read on, on foreign policy that, that was essentially about how US evangelicals have kind of like helped, you know, homophobia seep into the African continent, right? And I think what what really comes out of that is when you look at the anti-LGBT bill that was you know passed in Uganda, there was a, a person like at the center of it who came out. His name is Elisha Mukisi, and he was saying, "Oh, you know, I was formerly gay, and now I'm no more." And he was actually in, in parliament the, 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 like the day the bill was passed. But I'm, what, what I'm really getting at is how sort of like mainstream media essentially platformed him and sort of gave him a platform. Um, and I think that for for things to change, then, then there has to be more collaboration between mainstream media and like you know, alternative media platforms or people doing storytelling projects. You know, there's there's this sort of sense that we're enemies, you know, or that we're at odds or that we're always calling on mainstream media. But I do think there's ways in which legacy media can help, you know, amplify what other news organizations are doing, right? And there's also a need for collaboration among ourselves, you know. And it's really interesting that yesterday we were saying how we're all doing these things in different countries and different contexts, but we didn't know each other until this panel, right? And that's crazy because, like you, like you sometimes feel like you're like you're alone and you're doing this work alone. But there's so many people, and I, and I wish there was a way in which we could find more people, like this room, and just sort of like exist in that space because it's really powerful to know that yeah. you're not alone in kind of like what, what you're doing. So, again, thank you for coming. It's, it's really nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, thanks for coming. We will just yeah. be thanking yeah, each. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks so much for um, adding that, Caleb. Um, we have been having a lot of conversation about money, about uh, uh, funding, and the challenges that we are facing, the challenges I am facing uh, at Queerbeat, the organization uh, that I run. Um, uh, I've been to a lot of funders, and they continue to fund the legacy media outlets for whatever reasons that uh, uh, they, they do that. Uh, the funding space really needs to uh, change and uh, become more intentional and meaningful where they want to give the fund, what kind of uh, story tell, uh, tellers they want to enable. They really need to see that we need to tell uh, our own stories and what happens when we tell uh, our stories. Uh, I just want to quickly talk about uh, um, one of the recent stories that we did in India around aging uh, in the queer community. Um, we had not seen this story in the uh, traditional media space uh, in India. Uh, the issues that uh, uh, older queer people are facing uh, when they age, there is no support system. When they go to old age homes, what happens? Are they getting the support? Are they being turned down by the uh, old age homes? Do they need to go back to the closet uh, when they uh, grow old? So there are all sort of challenges, how the, the experience of aging is, is different for us, how many of us even survive to have old age. Uh, so these are the uh, questions that the uh, stories uh, we are doing are raising and these are the questions that uh, mainstream media is not talking about because they don't have us. Uh, so we need more queer storytellers, we need more collaborations uh, in this space. This is where I'll wrap up, I already got a signal uh, <laughs> from behind. I'll now open up this space for uh, questions and answers. Um, hands, okay. Hi. Um, is it working? Okay. Seems to be. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you very much for this um, panel. I think it's very important, and I think you shouldn't have to thank us for being here. I think there should be more people here. <laughs> um, and I know this is not actually the topic of this panel, but I want to ask about 
um, the representation in Western media of queer people in the global south, um, because I think we often think that we do better reporting on people in the global south, but what's missing, what you also touched upon, is how colonialism actually brought homophobia to a lot of places, and um, for the question I have to tell a story <laughs> shortly, um, because I've been researching on the representation um, of Uganda, um, and there was a Ugandan journalist who told me, that was in 2019, so a lot could have changed by then, um, that actually queer activists in Uganda don't like the way um, they're portrayed in Western media, and they say, we're actually making the um, the issue worse, and I would love to hear your opinion about that. <laughs> yeah, and that's a really great point. Um, so, I live in Uganda, used to until recently, but I, I think what's what's what really coming to the fore is recently um, there was I think uh, like an Amon Po show, and Amon Po is great, but I think there was a show in which she was interviewing the president of Uganda. And then she asked him, oh, like, so what are your thoughts on gay rights? And for many queer people in Uganda, the, the problem with that is every single time you bring a president of, a, of an African country, like on your platform, and you're constantly asking them, oh, what do you think about gay rights? The answer has not changed. The answer, if it changes, you'll be the first to hear, right? And so every time you ask them that, what you're essentially doing is that you're bringing, like, queer hate and queer violence to the fore. And that's a problem with Western media. And I think there's so many things that we can talk about, but I think that's just one that really came to mind. How we essentially sometimes, or how Western media essentially uses their platform. You, you, you can essentially see how people cover like the anti-LGBT building in Uganda, but like, like not many platforms have covered what queer activists have been doing for so many years in Uganda to sort of like in such re repressive circumstances. So the problem is if we, if we often think that the only way to sort of like platform queer lives from the global south in Western media is through violence and through, oh, so now what do you think about gay rights? That's just sort of contributing to the climate of hate against them. And that's the problem I think with it. And in Ghana, we had like absolutely the exact same situation where our president was on BBC Hard Talk and was asked, you know, the same question. And what that leads to is in the country, a lot of advocacy against, you know, queer people. Yeah, so it's completely not productive. Hey. Oh, is it my turn? Oh, please go ahead. No, I don't have questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so it's my turn. Okay, hi, I'm Anna. Thank you so much for this panel. My question is about um, representation in in media. I'm reacting to the GLAD survey that for 2022-2023 that said that representation of LGBTQ and even people of color of LGBTQ non-binary people is at record highs across live streaming, cable, and subscription platforms. So my first question is, where is why do we not see that kind of diversity in, in mainstream media, where are we, where, why can't we get it? And secondly, forgive me, I don't know if there's a similar survey or study about um, representation of, of gender diversity, different gender identities in mainstream media. If there is, I'd really appreciate a, a point in that direction. The current Reuters study is focused on women media representation. Thank you. No, thank you. I think that's a very important question. And it's uh, interesting that you mentioned GLAD because within the US, you still have research. And I was talking to Akur the other day that in the context of India and South Asia, we hardly have any data, you know. And on one hand, there is a case that, oh, queer people don't exist. That's what's happening in the Supreme Court right now with uh, the gay marriage debate because the government lawyer has made a case that this is an elitist urban phenomenon. But on the other hand, there is no data. So I think that's one thing, that there's not enough res uh, research and data that needs to be created. That's not happening, and there is a need for that. Number two is, I think, uh, again, power. Who tells the stories, right? Like, it's not like in India now, you will see that with Netflix and a lot of other platforms, queer content is being produced. But who... Who are the actors? You know, it's mostly cis head actors that are playing this role. Who is in the production? You know, across the production pipeline, how do you create entry? You know, because it's a whole process. And I think at TQMP, one of the things we are doing is we are currently also in the process of planning a screenwriting lab for queer screenwriters from South Asia. Just to think of how do you occupy that space, you know? And okay. Just last question yeah. over there. You've had a question, right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hi, thanks so much for the, for the panel. My name is Camila. I would like to, to ask you, if you think there are lessons and there are examples of other Global South countries that are doing better when covering uh, queer populations that could serve as in inspiration for your, for your own context. I'm, I'm asking this because I'm, I'm thinking in the Brazilian media, for example, and I think with all the, with all the limitations that exist there, uh, it seems uh, to be a, a similar, uh, a quite different way of, of dealing with, with queer representation than the context that you are mentioning. So are there examples in the Global South that you look, look up to? Sorry, I have been trying to look, but within South Asia, we do not really have uh, uh, good examples to look at. Uh, uh, the newsrooms for us are still not safe. We are still constantly uh, negotiating whether, can, can I tell my editor that I am queer? And if I want to do a queer story, will they think that I'm doing it because I'm queer? So every time I'm questioning, uh, can I do this? because the spaces are not safe. And the spaces are not safe because the leader is somebody else, not us. That's where I'll, I'll close this, and, uh, but we're here, talk to us, we'll talk more. <laughs> yeah.